I worked my whole life representing athletes from team sports, and they were the best in the world at what they do, but they weren't boxers, they weren't tennis players, they weren't golfers, they didn't play for themselves. And the greatest ones had to learn how to mold their talents, their incredible talents, and work with people who weren't as good as they were at what they did, but that they needed on the team in order to win. You are really uh, sort of like the unspoken, unsung hero of, of futurism. You kind of get a sense of where the future is heading because you have a way of looking at the present in a certain way. And so when you look at right now, how much of how the world has been wrestling with the pandemic, during that time, you realize that mankind's really got a crisis of confidence in healthcare in the way in which governments are thinking about how people will gracefully grow older, where that will happen, and the kind of services that they'll actually have access to. Did you sense this given the way you entered into that asset class, the adult active care facility world? When did that occur to you? Well, sort of, it was a two-step process, I would say. So step one, when I teach, I'm on college, you mentioned, I like to teach. And one of the things I teach my students, because, you know, to teach, whether you're teaching someone golf or you're teaching economics or you're teaching marketing, I think you have to address it in a way that people will remember what you're trying to teach them. It's not enough just to say it. One of my favorite people in the world died last year named John Thompson, who was the basketball coach at Georgetown. He was a brilliant man and he had like a, a PhD in human nature. He really understood people. And he would say to me from time to time, because I'm a very impatient listener, I like to interrupt. And he said, David, let me explain something to you. Hearing is physical but listening is psychological. You have to want to listen. So I was involved in a real estate company that I started about 2014 with a person that hadn't been in real estate before, but was a friend and I lost a lot of money. Now you can have one of two reactions when you get in a situation like, you say, okay, forget real estate, not for me, I, I'm not comfortable. Or you could be stubborn and competitive like I am both and say, God, I'm not going to walk away as a loser. I really believe that there's a way to do this, but I didn't do it the right way. I didn't pick the right horse, didn't pick a person who was an expert, who had experience or had a good vision. So I met Joel Anderson, who had 30 years experience, was on the governor's commission, the chairman of the board, the governor's commission on senior living in Florida. And I said to him, look, I really believe in the space. You know, I think the aging, as I mentioned, the aging of the population, but you are an expert in operations. You understand the needs right down to the bricks and mortar. And so we got together. So it was a little bit out of stubbornness. At, at the time we got together, it was just around the onset of the pandemic. So I don't want to mislead anyone and say I had this amazing look into the future. I knew the pandemic was going to come. Just like Trump had no vision knowing the pandemic was going to end. He thought it was going to end in, you know, April of 2000. And he was only a million people deaths off, but he was close. It was fortuitous. And I think in business, you have to have a great plan and you have to be facile enough to be able to pivot as you see forces around you changing. That's what makes great entrepreneurs. You're not going to be successful every time out of the box and you have to learn from your mistakes. So I like to say when I teach that I come from the Clint Eastwood School of Business. And my students say, Mr. Falk, what on earth does that mean? I said, it means, and I can't do a great imitation. A man's got to know his limitations. You got to know what you're good at, what you're not good at. What you're not good at, you have to find really smart people and around you. Obviously, you know, you have an amazing network of people in the financial world. I wanted to access that not only for our real estate business, but for other businesses I'm in, as you know. And because I, like you, I do believe in partnership. I worked my whole life representing athletes from team sports. And they were the best in the world at what they do, but they weren't boxers, they weren't tennis players, they weren't golfers, they didn't play for themselves. And the greatest ones had to learn how to mold their talents, their incredible talents, and work with people who weren't as good as they were at what they did, but that they needed on the team in order to win. And I think great quarterbacks, great generals know how to harness the power of everyone on the team to make it synergistic, to make the some of the parts, some of you know, great make the whole greater than some of the parts. I'm in two SPACs actually right now, two special purpose acquisition companies. And I was asked to be the chairman of the first one, offered a lot of money. I was very intrigued, but I had my own reasons I didn't want to be the chairman. So I said to the to the founder, I said, I'm going to recommend a guy to be our chairman, Harvey Schiller. 
He's an older gentleman. He's 82 years old. Started his business career at age 46 as a retired Brigadier General in the Air Force. And he has the best resume of anyone I've ever met in my life. He was the commissioner of the Southeast Conference of Football, which is the number one college conference. For those of you who watched the national championship Monday night, Alabama and Georgia were both in the SEC. He then went and became the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee prior to the Dream Team in 92. Then he became the president of Turner Broadcasting. Then he founded the Yankees Nets Network. Then he did the America's Cup. He ran a sports agency in Canada called Asante. He's on the Hall of Fame Committee in baseball. The guy's just a very, he's a great guy. And what I learned in the course of the SPAC over the last year and a half, we have a lot of very, very talented people who have been very successful and all have big egos. And you need one person to be the damn general to control the group. And so we're doing the money raise for the SPAC. We're trying to raise $250 million. And Harvey and myself and a third gentleman named John Miller, who was the chairman of AOL before they sold to Time Warner, another old friend of mine from the NBA, we raised $1.3 billion in five days. And in order to manage the calls, Harvey said, okay, we're going to be on these, just like this, we're on a Zoom with, you know, one every hour for like 10 hours a day. We have to have some stability in these discussions. So don't answer a question if I don't call on you. So we all said, great. So we're on a call. Guy asked me a question. Harvey said, yeah, David, answer the question. So I answered it. He had a follow-up question. And I started to answer the follow-up and Harvey interrupts me and said, excuse me, did I call on you? <laughs> no, sir. Now, so you need a general who can harness the talents, the disparate talents of the group and make it work. And so I've spent my whole career in team sports. And I definitely believe no matter how talented you think you are, no matter how successful you think you've been, it always takes a team of people to make you better.